There's a place called Huehuetenango. It's a real place. I've been there, and it's in Guatemala. My mom was born there in Guatemala. You know, I was born here in San Francisco and raised here in the Bay Area. But when I was 18, I went to Huehuetenango with my mom. Now, I don't really speak Spanish. I speak what they teach you in school, which is not the same thing. But my mom speaks Spanish fluently because it was her first language. So in Guatemala, I needed her to translate everything for me. Now, Huehuetenango is way up in the mountains. It's in the jungle and it's beautiful, but it's far from everything. Like there's no Starbucks, there's no In-N-Out, there's no Home Depot. I, they don't even have a Costco. At least they didn't back then when I was 18. But it was like the Old West. Now, not the fun Disney version of the Old West, but the kind of scary shootout at high noon version of the Wild West. If you Google it, you'll see it's still a pretty dangerous place. One time I was walking with my cousin and I saw a big guy staring at us there and he was looking mean and I couldn't say anything because I don't speak Spanish. So I stared, stared back at him, just kind of going, what are you looking at? And then my cousin said he was kind of nervous and it was time to go back to the house, so we did. Later that night, my mom wanted to walk around the village and see some of her family and friends that she hadn't seen since she was a kid. So we knocked on a couple of doors and the people came out and looked at me kind of confused. Now, you should know that most Guatemalans are not 6'1 and 230 pounds like I was. In fact, while I was there, I only saw one guy that was as tall as me and he turned out to be a basketball player from Iowa. But when the people came out and opened their door and they looked at my mom and heard her talking to them in Spanish, they quickly figured out who she was. Now, we came to this one door and we knocked and that same big, mean, staring guy opened the door and he saw me. His face turned red and he shouted something in Spanish that I'm pretty sure was a threat, telling me we were gonna fight. Just as he started to move towards me though, my mom yelled out, Miguelito! And he looked at her and his eyes grew wide and he hugged her. And they started talking way too fast for me to understand. But I caught that my mom told him to be nice to me because I was her son. And he said he was glad she told him I was her son because otherwise he was gonna have to fight me. And I would have lost. See, my mom saved me. She knew she had influence with this scary guy. She grew up with him. He was her cousin. She knew once he heard her voice and knew who she was, everything would change. If my mom decided not to use her influence to help me, I would have been in big trouble. Now, sometimes we don't know what to do with our power or influence or advantages but they're useful tools. If we don't use them, or we use them incorrectly, we just miss out. So we need to look at what God says about power. And let's start way back in Genesis chapter two. God says to eat from any tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then in Genesis three, Adam and Eve are hanging out and the serpent shows up and convinces them to eat the fruit from the one tree they were told not to eat from. The only tree God said don't eat from, they eat from. See, the serpent used his power and influence to mislead and control Adam and Eve, to get them to do what he wanted them to do. Then after they eat the fruit, they see that they're naked. So they sew some leaves together to cover up. And then they hear God walking in the garden and what do they do? They freak out, they hide because they're scared for the first time. And then they use whatever influence or persuasion they have to blame others. Adam says, the woman that you put here with me did it. He blames Eve and God. Eve says, the serpent tricked me. I'm a victim. It's someone else's fault, not mine. Adam and Eve use their power and influence to blame someone else. You can call it influence or advantage or resources, but we already see here in the Garden of Eden that there are different ways to use power. We can use it for ourselves like the serpent and use it to get what we want, manipulating, 
and controlling others, like Adam and Eve throwing others under the bus to save ourselves. Or we can use it to benefit others like God did. Now, we're only three chapters into the Bible, and we already see how differently God uses power. He takes a formless void that people couldn't even survive in, and God makes paradise, a garden where the people he made, who are his image bearers, can thrive and grow and be happy, and where we had freedom. And that's an important example God gives us of how to use our power Now, there's a pattern in Genesis that shows us what what God is and then how Satan or the serpent is the opposite. God is the creator. Satan is the destroyer. God is the protector. Satan is our adversary. God uses his power to do good for others. Satan uses his power selfishly to control, deceive, and manipulate Most of the creation stories we see in other religions in this area were stories of gods fighting, struggling for power over each other. There's one creation story that's really interesting because it basically says two gods fought because they both wanted to be in control. And one god killed the other, and now we live on the corpse of that dead god. It's a sweet story, huh? But that shows us what motivates the world's use of power getting our way, getting someone to do what we want them to, control. But that is not true of God. He uses power to bless and benefit others. From the very beginning, God creates out of love for us, to do good for us. Other creation stories tell us everything was created out of war or violence or battle. But we know that God created everything in peace and out of love for our benefit. It's so different. It's hard for us to understand, honestly. We think, what use is power, influence, and resources if it doesn't get me what I want? And we all have advantages and resources that others don't have. I know it's become popular to deny that we have advantages because it can make us look or feel like we're immoral or elitist. But I cannot deny that I have an advantage over my cousins who were born in other places, like Wewetenango. I have that advantage because my mom came here and worked hard to give me an easier life and a great education. That education is just one advantage I have. But having a resource or power or influence isn't really the important thing. What's important is what I do with it. Do I use it for myself or for others? Being a man, I have certain advantages. In certain circles, being a boss, I have some influence that others don't. That's not the important thing, though. The important thing, and when I say important, I mean important to Jesus. The important thing to Jesus is what I do with any and all resources, advantages, or power that I have. I had a friend in Belize, and he was from Guatemala, and he fled there uh, because of some dangerous persecution, along with a lot of other families. And they built huts and shacks on a wide part of the road in the jungle in Belize, and they settled there. Now, he had a little market that sold fruit and vegetables and stuff. And I remember his village wasn't connected to the electrical grid, so they didn't have electricity for a long time. Eventually they did, but it was a really slow process. And he was the first market to have electricity anywhere nearby, which may not sound like a big deal, but it really was. His market was the only place to get a cold soda or cold water or anything that needed refrigeration. At night, it was the only place that had lights in the darkness. Also, he found an old VCR somewhere and had a box of old movies from the 80s. And there weren't theaters anywhere, and no one had a TV, so this was the only place to watch a show or see a movie. And he would show a movie every single night, and it felt like half the village would show up and get something to eat, maybe a candy bar or a Coke, and they'd all watch the movie. No other market had that. 
He used his resources to make a really good profit. But the next year I was there, I saw that almost every other market had electricity and was showing movies on different nights of the week. And I asked him about it. And he said he only showed movies two nights a week now. He helped the other markets connect to the electrical lines. He helped them find VCRs and he even let them borrow movies to show. I asked him why he would do that. Because he could have been the biggest market around. He could have been the Costco of Belize. He said the other market owners had families too, and he didn't need all the money for himself. Doesn't that feel in line with the example God gives us in the garden of how we're supposed to use power? See, my friend took capitalism and business and made them tools to care for others. I don't know if he's the best businessman, but I know he's a good Christ follower because this is exactly what Jesus tells us to do to bless image bearers, that's everyone. In, in Matthew 25, there are three parables that we usually think of as disconnected, but they're really not. The first parable is about 10 bridesmaids or virgins preparing for a wedding. And the bridesmaids were supposed to go out to meet the groom coming into town for the wedding. Some of the bridesmaids had extra oil for their lamps, but some didn't, they just brought their lamps. Now the groom was late. And eventually, around midnight, they hear that the groom is close, so the bridesmaids go out to meet him. The ones who had extra oil were ready to go, but the other ones, without oil, they ask, can we have some of your oil? But they're told no, because they might run out and then no one would be ready. So the ones who weren't ready went out to buy oil. By the time they got back, the groom was already in the wedding banquet and the door was closed. The bridesmaids who didn't think ahead couldn't even get into the wedding. Jesus is saying, be prepared, plan ahead and be ready. Now, the second parable is called the parable of the talents or the bag of, bags of gold. The master in this parable calls three of his servants in and gives one of them five bags of gold. To another, he gives two bags of gold. And to the last one, he gives one bag of gold. After a long trip, the master comes home and he asks, what happened with the bags of gold I gave you? The guy who got five bags of gold invested it and got five more bags, and the master is happy. The guy who got two bags of gold invested that as well, and he got two more bags of gold and the master is happy. In fact, the master says the exact same thing to each of those two servants. He's just as happy with the second servant as he is with the first servant because his happiness comes from his servants using what he gave them, not from how much gold he got back. Now the third servant who got one bag of gold, he didn't put it to work. He buried it in the ground and he gave the master back his one bag of gold. And the master is not happy. He takes the bag of gold and he kicks the servant out. Jesus tells us, to invest our resources, whatever they are, whether it's financial, influence, advantages of any kind, and we need to invest them the way Jesus wants us to. So now we have to ask, how does Jesus want me to invest and use my power? Well, the answer is in the third parable Jesus shares in Matthew 25. He says he will separate people just like a shepherd separates sheep and goats and the sheep will be pl placed to his right, because they're the faithful ones. Matthew 25, verse 34 to 40, says this. The king will say to those on the right, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king 
will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Does that mess with you like it messes with me? Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me? See, I tried to do good things for people in need, but I'd do a lot more if it was actually Jesus. Wouldn't you? Jesus just took the image bearer idea from the garden and he turned it up a notch. He says that person in need doesn't just bear my image, doesn't just look like me. That least of these person is me. Man, how does that change the way we serve others? How should it change the way we see others? You know, I was in San Francisco a while back and it was on a really cold night. And I saw a guy living on the street, sitting on the sidewalk without any socks. So I went into a drugstore and I bought a pack of socks for him and I gave them to him. If I knew that guy was Jesus, I would have done way more than just buy him some socks. Wouldn't you? Jesus is clearly telling us what he wants us to invest in. In the first parable, Jesus says, plan ahead, be ready. In the second parable, Jesus says, put your resources to work, invest them. And now here in the third parable, Jesus tells us how to invest, to use our advantage, our influence, our power to serve image bearers who need it whenever we can. My mom knew how to use her influence because she loves me. My friend in Belize knew how to use his advantage and resources because he loved his neighbors. Jesus directs us to do the same thing, to love others by using any power we have for their benefit. This is a huge part of what Jesus created the church to do. This is who we're supposed to be. So this week, think about the garden, how God created it for you and for me. God used his power to create paradise for us, to bless us. And then ask Jesus who in your community needs you to bless them with your power. Then make a plan and do it. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that you use us to care for those around us. Thank you that you first cared for us. Lord, thank you that you created paradise for us to demonstrate how much you love us and how precious we are to you. This week, Lord, I ask that we would be able to demonstrate your love by using any and all resources that we have to care for our neighbors because it's what love requires. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Wait, wait, before you go, three things. First, please consider becoming one of Cornerstone Fellowship's financial partners. Your donations will ensure that you'll be able to continue enjoying helpful and hopefully life-changing messages like the one you just watched. And number two, please share the link to this message with anyone who you know needs it or will be blessed by it or post the link to your own personal social platforms. And finally, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you'll be alerted whenever we post more content. Thanks for watching.